Hello, family of Fortnite. Ball TW here, and throughout the Fortnite Champion Series, we're going to be trying to get more acquainted with the world of competitive Fortnite. Today, we're going to be discussing the three different stages of a competitive Fortnite game. The early game, the mid game, and the late game. And what different players have as their goals during these stages in order to achieve the ultimate goal, the victory royale. Let's start with the early game. Also called the looting phase, this is where all players are attempting to secure their chosen landing spot and maximize their loot potential. In competitive Fortnite, every game matters. So players try to strike a balance between high loot opportunity and safety so as to not waste a game by being eliminated early. Do you drop at a high loot POI like Retail Row or Paradise Palms? Or land at a safer POI on the edge of the map where less players drop because of less loot? Regardless, the goal is common. Whether you take a passive approach by looting safely on the side of the map or an aggressive and risky approach by letting others loot for you and finding early eliminations. Now that we know what the early game is, what should we be looking out for during this stage? First things first, being contested. The first realization players make when landing is whether you're being contested or not to prepare for the upcoming possible fight. Trios want to try to force your opponent into the more disadvantageous position cut off from loot potential. Either they have to make a desperation push or they're stuck with less loot where you can easily clean up. That's just the beginning, as even though it starts off high intensity with all the different POIs being contested, it quickly slows down as the rotations begin towards first zone. Looting doesn't end here, and most competitive players will have a loot path which optimizes their possibility for finding the crucial mobility and weapon upgrades. Thanks to the new battle map feature in the replay mode, we can study these loot paths and rotations quite easily these days. So go check that out in any replay from the Fortnite Champion Series by going into the Compete tab and finding your favorite player. It will vary from game to game, but generally, we move into the mid game around the middle to end of second zone. The mid game is the calm before the storm, before the storm circle gets too small where it forces the engagements. Most players' goals aren't positional, but in some cases, depending on how the early game went, you again have to strike a balance, this time between looting and farming or going for the best position. Looting could include playing extremely aggressive to earn yourself other players' loot. In trios, it's much harder to play that aggressive playstyle, since fights take longer and cost more. You want to be efficient with any rotations or fights you have to take. You don't want to spend your precious mobility, valuable resources, or health. This is why you'll see a lot of the top players look directly for center zone in the mid game. When you're in the center zone, you end up giving yourself the most chance of being in the next storm circle when it gets revealed. You'll then have to go less distance and thus spend less materials. Finally, the end game, the most exciting, hectic, thrilling, and difficult part of competitive Fortnite. Experiencing an end game can be confusing and hard to process, but it will also be one of the most rewarding and fun times to play and watch. This is when you take all the advantages you built in the early game and the mid game and use them to push yourself to a victory royale and also find as many eliminations as possible. In the current Fortnite Champion Series format, every elimination matters, just like it did in the World Cup. From 6th zone onwards, where the calm from the mid game explodes into a cacophony of tunneling, mobility usage, and shots being fired, you'll see teams go for the ever so advantageous high ground, where they can tunnel very cheaply and have the most opportunity on the rest of the server for elimination, as they have the top down view. You'll also see teams call out the need to find a good layer, which is away from other players, both above, below, and horizontally from you. You'll see teams desperate for the extra materials to last them through to the full zone closure, going for impact eliminations, where they can top off on resources and power weaponry of their fallen opponents. So, whether you're watching or you're joining us on the field, take stock in the stage of the game. The early game, when you're trying to get the best possible loot while it's still available. The mid game, where you're balancing positioning while maintaining what you built during the early game. And finally, the end game, where you spend all the advantages you set yourself up with to earn the victory royale. Use this to form your game plan in order to earn as many series points weekend after weekend. And maybe next time, we'll be watching and highlighting your top plays. This was Bala TW, and I'll see you in game. What's up everyone, Sundown here to bring you the latest installment of Plays of the Week. The final opportunity to qualify for the Fortnite Champion Series happened over the weekend and a number of players were able to push their way to the top and make some spectacular plays. Let's dive in and see who popped off. Kicking off Plays of the Week, we'll start with Kurtz down in South America as he lets no targets get away and says, not today.
Chang down in South America. We're on board here with nothing, no name, as he's able to pull off the hot feet flank and get the positional advantage to pick up a number of elites. Next, popping over to the Middle East, we have M. Siddig on the tack attack, going to work in eliminating the rest of the lobby. Now normally we say jumping on over, but this time we mean it quite literally as 72 hours does the leapfrog to pick up an insane elimination. Staying over in NA East, we have the world champion solo player Buga, well, dropping his opponents down a level or two. Now over to Europe as we watch Fnatic Provoked get himself out of a tight situation and be the lone survivor to run the rest of the lobby. Sometimes in Fortnite, you need to innovate a little bit, and right now Jordan uses everything in his toolkit to pick up two quick elims. And finally, over in NA West, is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's Rex getting his high ground shot out and going for a last ditch effort to get everything he can. That's it for the top plays from the qualifiers and the stage has been set as we head into the finals this weekend. Make sure to tune in at fortnite.com slash watch or in client and we'll see you guys on the battle bus. Beep beep. Hey guys, Shio Wager here, and today we're going to be analyzing some of the biggest and most loot-heavy drop spots in the game. From everything to loot pads, timing, and fighting, the most crucial time that sets the tone of the rest of the game is the early game and your drop spot. Top shows have developed ways to split up and attack each of their drops in their own special ways, and we're going to dive in and see some of the basics of each of these spots, as well as who's utilizing them to place high on the leaderboards. Rito Row is an old drop that returns with a new twist in Season X. With both obelisks offering high priority loot and cube monsters offering free shield and ammo drops, getting control of this drop fast and early can put you at a huge advantage endgame, offering multiple options from increased launch pads, excess shields, diverse utility, and big hitting weapons from all ranges. This drop gets split down the middle halfway, separated into the block tops and the houses slash residential side. Most of the time, looting and moving is faster at the block tops, and an increased elevation on height by default allows for an advantage to whichever trio lands there compared to those at the residential side of the drop. With two vending machines and multiple chests available too, the trio that controls block tops controls the entire engagement, usually being the ones to come out on top. Mongrel, Benji Fishy, and Mitro have adopted and trained at this drop over multiple weeks of the FNCS. From forcing early game fights on Blacktop to coming in late for third parties from the residential side, they use every advantage depending on the type of situation they have to beat other trios and win week after week, leaving the whole lobby scared every time they thank the bus driver. 
Happy Hamlet has been the drop most competitive players envy, with most chest spawns and many vending machines to boot. Having good options for rotations with zip lines and drift boards, as well as the option of excess loot to get snowside if you have zone, winning this drop and having room to play is a player's dream come true. Playing this drop, however, is very difficult. Usually with two to four teams contesting you because of how abundant and plentiful loot is, you will always have an uphill fight to face and conquer quickly if you want an advantage heading into mid game. Taking fights here is all about who engages first and who gets to third party, with most engagements ending quick, as many angles taken are vertical, making it a lot easier to hit headshots for that damage multiplier. Close range box fights are also very common, with less room for mistakes and instant eliminations on knocked players keeping all opponents healthy off of Siphon. Eclipse, Mega, and Dubs land at Happy, usually preferring the north side of the drop, and although might have trouble making it at an early game in a few of their games, the loot they get when the drop ends up working out sets them up for exponentially more points in the end game with lots of mobility, shields, and high rarity weapons to make big clutches with. Landing at powerful drop spots is a challenge that requires practice and teamwork to overcome. Being efficient with comms, having a plan, being prepped and ready, as well as adapting to anything you see on the glide are keys in being successful in the early parts of your game. Use that edge for a boost on the competition in endgame, securing good placement and elim points with your trio. And who knows, maybe you can be on the top of the leaderboards playing in the grand finals of the FNCS. What's up, Fortnite fam? It's me, Zeke, and we're hanging out with our best friend, Sundown. We're doing something a little crazy, Sundown. Oh, are we now, Zeke? What are we doing? We are going to make some very bold predictions heading into the finals of the FNCS. We also have our friend, Monster Deface, standing by, and Shia Wager. Gentlemen, if you want to say hello. What's up, boys? Hey, yo. Very quickly, within 30 seconds or less, you guys got to tell me your predictions for the region. All right, we're starting with Middle East, Sundown. Give me your prediction. So everyone else went with Fiesel, Kappa, and Klops. They won four of the five times, but I think them splitting their trios might have given them not enough practice. So my bet is gonna go towards Flame, Prime, and Hunter. Expect to see them challenging towards the top and can't leave out Fiesel, Klops, and Kappa as well. All right, Monster D-Face, OCE, go. Honestly, I'm gonna have to go with Geese, Slaya, and Skyla. And the main reason is because Parpy and his trio actually went to NA East, where you guys saw them dominate the region in week four. So with that being said, I know the X2 twins are, you know, kind of one of the fan faves coming up, but I think Geese, Slaya, and Skyla are really gonna give OCE a run for its money coming up. Now for Asia, coming back to you, Sundown, what are those predictions? So Asia, and I've been pretty adamant about this, how there's been about five to 10 teams who are consistently up top, but my pick is actually the WGS trio of Jag, Horde, and QLO. They played over in Europe for the World Cup. They've had the most amount of experience. I think that's what's gonna allow them to win out. Sure, sure. Speaking of Europe, Shy Wager, you're up. You guys already know who the kings are of Europe, Mitro, Mongol, and Benji, but the only trio I think that can start a revolution are Stompy, Chinkin, and Aqua. They have a kind of counter play style. They already have a rivalry brewing with the kings of Europe, and I think these guys will have the edge taking it over at the end of the Grand Finals. All right, for NA East, Shy, we're gonna pick your brain again. Give us those predictions. So one of the favorite picks to win NA East are Bucky, Animal, and Aspect, but I think the counter to that trio, who's really strong at the moment, is Clicks, Crimson, Spades. They play kind of a rugged type of low ground situation, always getting their win condition at the very end of the game. So I think their type of randomness and weird plays that happen at the end will have them make big plays to win at the end of the Grand Finals. Now let's talk about Brazil. Gentlemen, I'm gonna take this one. I'm gonna make a bold claim here. I'm gonna say the red trio is gonna bring it home. Snow, Avalar, and Techno Viking. We've seen Techno Viking Viking, he almost made World Cup qualifiers, just barely missed out on qualifying. The same for Snow and Avalar. This will be their weekend. They're very hungry for the win. I'm telling you guys, they are gonna do it. Now, finally, let's wrap up with NA West. Monster D-Face, give us your take. I'd be crazy not to mention the trio, Scented, Rex, and Edgy, because they've been the most consistent in the NA West region. But I think another trio that can give them a run for their money is gonna be Arkham, Falconer, and Vinny. And Falconer, by the way, the only free agent on this team here in the NA West at the top of the board still dominating. So I would love to see them come through and pull it big for the NA West region. Some pretty bold predictions made across the board from everyone. Sundown, Shy Wager, Monster D-Face, thank you guys so much for hanging out. And for everyone at home, don't forget, tune in this weekend for the FNCS Finals, September 20th through the 22nd. You can watch at Fortnite.com slash watch. And of course, guys, we'll see you on the Battle Bus. Beep, beep. <laughs>
Fortnite fam? We've missed you guys so much, and now we are here for the grand finals of the Fortnite Champion Series. Now, you guys know who I am. I'm Zeke. Well, let's introduce the crew that we hanging out all weekend long. On the left of me, you've got Sundown, the luscious locks, T posing on everyone with a nice little dab. In the back, you've got Dr. Lupo. He recently won an award for being an incredible human being. And to his right, you've got Monster D-Face, uh, incredible content creator, and people still confuse us for some reason. I'm not sure why. Up in front, you've got Shia Wager, the big man with even bigger plans. He's a 10 out of 10, and by the end of the stream, he will be eating a cup of mayonnaise. Now, Fortnite fam, I know you guys are ready to get into all of the action, but first, we should probably get all these new faces to the broadcast up to speed on how the broadcast is going to be run. Let's start with the broadcast schedule. So right now, we're going to be hopping into Europe during one of the heats going on right now. Later on, we'll take a look at some of the replays from Middle East that happened this morning with a live look in at Brazil lit after that. And then we'll wrap the day with NA East. Now, how are these guys racking up their points? Let me get you uh, up to speed on that. So first off, 9th through 12th will get you three points. Like placing between 5th and 8th is six. Three and fourth, I'm sorry, third and fourth is nine points. Second place is 12 points, and that victory royale is worth 15, with every elimination being one point. Now, the prize pool across the FNCS has been $10 million, and here is a prize distribution for this weekend. A lot of money to be divvied out, and of course, the money is great, but being able to be crowned the first ever season champions across all regions is an even better feat. Now, before hopping into the games, uh, we made some predictions earlier on in the week for Europe. There is one among us that is uh, had a bit of a different opinion, and that's fine. We'll get there. But Sundown, why don't you tell us about our predictions from Europe? So I'll talk about our predictions since the rest of us decided that, you know, we had a brain and were able to look at what went on in the past five <laughs> weeks. And Mitra <laughs> Mongo and Benji just wiped the floor with the rest of the region. They averaged a 1.4 placement, three wins, two second places. I know I've always harped on it, but it took literally four really, really bad games in both of those weeks for them to get barely edged out into second place. And any other time they played their game, they been on top but uh shy it seems like you went a different direction well like, i understand they got their high placements they're in their high castle but personally i see a revolution coming i predict the upset stompy chicken and aqua actually taking it all home at the end of the grand finals they're amazing but i think they won't have what it takes ultimately and aqua will steal the race at the very end well, we'll have to see how things pan out for these trios now. Uh, like I said earlier, by the end of the broadcast, Shy will be eating a cup of mayonnaise if MMB wins out in Europe. So we'll have to see if that pans out for everyone. Now, guys, we are going to be jumping into game number two of heat number one in Europe. We're going to be jumping right into the all the action. And to do so, we've got Monster D-Face, Dr. Lupo. Gentlemen, take it away. Zeke, thank you very much. For those that are confused, Shy went on Twitter and made a bet and said if... Uh, if <laughs> If the three that we've all, I mean, we, we've, we've seen them just absolutely destroyed thus far. If they do, in fact, win, then he will eat not a cup, an entire jar of mayonnaise on stream. And to be quite honest with you, I think that might be some of the best content that I've seen on, uh, on the Internet in quite a while. Now, going into Europe here, like I said, game two, it's already, uh, it's already rolling right now. That's Monster, it. before Let's we jump right into it, what do you think? How do you think things are going to play out today? I think my stomach hurts. I'm going to have to sit down and uh, let this one kind of digest as we jump into these games. But let's go ahead and hop right in. It's Europe. They're trying to get to the grand finals. There's going to be a lot of action unfolding today, Doc Lupo. Lo and behold, 95 players remaining. Only one trio in, in hole has gone down. And we're jumping right into retail with the trio themselves Benji, Mongrel, and Mitro. Uh, honestly, some of the most dominant players in solos and duos, and now they're they're all they're trioed up. That's right. And, and crazy kid it already. A gold RPG. That's right literally, here. literally what I want to touch on crazy. right there. Look, the retail look, row loot. Look at the inventory. Sets them up for success. You're looking at straight up legendary inventory. And the best of the best. What do they choose? Shield bubbles. Shield bubbles. One of the new uh, you know, items introduced to Fortnite. And it's a great item, right? It's so versatile. So you're gonna see shockwaves, you're gonna see launch pads, campfires, and even with the recent adjustment to the loot, the way it's divvied out here in retail, it's still so prominent in the loadouts. You're going to see the difference. And just look at the map on the side. Basically, no one around them to contest. It, it's wild to think. So I, I'm going to say it, and I'm pretty sure everyone is already thinking it, as we've seen them play over the course of the qualifiers for this event. If no one contests retail 
or or it's lightly contested. Let's say somebody drops black tops and then and they take Resi's side or, or oh, however it's split. I can tell you what that means. It, 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 it means it, Shio is 100% eating, eating the mayonnaise. Eating the 100% mayonnaise. 100% guaranteed eating <laughs> the mayonnaise. Uh, in fact, production, can we get a jar of mayonnaise ready just at some point uh, before Sunday? Because based on what we've seen thus far, we have an insane mat count across the board already. Look, look at the inventory. This this is this is ridiculous. This they is they are kitted to the teeth. 11 points already going into game two. Game one must have. Uh, I, we'll have to take a, uh, a look back if we can see exactly how that played out for them in the previous round. But they're moving in. They're, they have maybe. Uh, granted, we can see on the mini map that there's nobody at Dusty Depot right now. But that's a potential loot, you know, drop spot for a trio at this point. But right now it's uncontested. You see there's builds there and there's no one around. They have free rotation in. You see where the next circle ends up. Meanwhile, you're going to have teams smushed up against each other already on the movement in, fighting it out. We're looking all the way to the, the north side of the map, just past the block. A number of players probably drop it up there. And this is yep. a veteran team right here. The Vic, Robabs, and Falcony been around the scene for a long while here, and they, they are just dictating the pace of this battle here as they're trying to look for this push right now. The shield bubble's not going to be effective. He actually had to push out of it, and it's a 3v1 situation right here. Down, down comes the Stinker. That's going to have to push him back, and it should be a nice, easy close-in. You see right there. Got him the zoned angles. inside. One box is. left. The quick edit, the swap. Lands Ooh, the shot, nice trap from trap. above, dodges it. Basically no damage taken. It's a good attempt. Pretty good, pretty good attempt right there. Did try to, uh, you know, catch the Vic off guard, but he was fast enough. Managed to kind of sneak on through. By the way, on the right this. side of your screen, here's the results of game one. You see Mongrel, Mitro, Benji Fishy taking fifth place. Obelfly, Miro, and so in the first place position up there, which means 15 points for that trio. There's the remainder of your top 10. Just a quick info blast there for you if you did not see game one on any of the, the channels that might be uh, streaming their gameplay right now. And I love that. I love check, that right? we can see exactly where we're at with the leaderboard. That was the wrap up of game one, your top 10 teams coming into game two now. And remember, every single heat, they're going against one another. So we're going to see rivalry. The best, like, like that leaderboard is going to change with every single elimination, Indeed. every battle. They're going against each other. With the exception, of course, uh, once Mongrel Mitro and Benji take that first place spot. I'm just saying, they, they have been playing insane. That's not to say that that anybody else can't potentially take that top spot. It, it's very possible. I mean, even Skite Hunter and Kisar from Solary and, and Lestream, uh, this is an excellent trio in itself. But man, just the dominant gameplay from MMB has been insane to watch. Yeah, Sundown, up here on Sundown, top of the hill now. Sundown put it best. It's uh, Europe playing catch up here with our with our favorite, I guess, team to look out for. But Absolutely. we'll see how the performances go here as Hunter, Sky, and Kingstar are just going to base up, kind of sit just outside of the Tilted Town. You can take a look at that map there. Players are setting up. They're setting the perches. The high grounds are being claimed. And that is how you can start to choke out squads that are rotating late here. Now, they are going to hopefully, you know, get a little bit of that RNG, right? Get that zone to fall in their favor because otherwise they'd, they'd have to burn some valuable resource early on. I, I will say over 10 seasons of Fortnite, this hill has been one of the most consistent high ground advantage spots to take. And even now you, you're looking down on Tilted Town where there's no building. You have essentially free shots on players that do for some reason choose or are forced to rotate through there. This spot is, is insanely good. You have Clear line of sight on so many different locations. Even the high hill to the north, which is higher high ground uh, elevation wise, you still have a clear line of sight on a majority of what's up there. There's only a little nub at the top that can block line of sight of anybody that's moving on the, on the north side of that hill. This this trio, Sky, Keenstar, Hunter, they're in a great spot going into the next circle. Absolutely. There's no reason for them to move right now either. As you said, they have a nice line of sight over the field here. And all those tags, those are crucial tags. Remember, Storm Surge can affect anyone here, so you have to be proactive. You can't just sit around and be complacent with uh, your positioning. You have to be actively seeking for damage if you don't want to get taken out by the Storm Surge. But here we have another little engagement about to go down here. It looks like the Vic is uh, currently turning you know, this house inside out. There's a team very close by. Rotating for just the southeast there, the gas station. Plus, you do have one more player at the gazebo in the middle of 
Pleasant Park going to rotate up on top and I think now's the time to try and get a height advantage. You don't want anybody to apply too much pressure. Plus they are further away from the zone. So the team from TCK they are in a good spot to just try and storm hold this if that's what it comes down to. You have three potential point pickups here. Eliminations actually pressure going in here. Muser taking the high ground on top of this trio. Use that shockwave and got up on top. I would expect pressure from the other two here momentarily. We will see. But there is another trio. Look on the minimap. You have another team coming in from behind. So now both the do both the trios that we just saw on your screen right now that are fighting it out here at this northeast building in Pleasant, they're about to get storm held by another team down that are they're moving in as well. This is gonna be three teams fighting basically in one building in a second here. And Gems is eliminated. You have a couple pickups there. Levit uh, the Vic. Three eliminations now, a ton of materials, but you do have literally another team on top of them right now. And that's what happens when Storm Surge comes into effect. People do desperate things. So this team was totally fine, uh, parked up here, but now they have to force the push here. They have to defend themselves. And lucky for them, they get the tags, they get the trees, and their entire trio is still standing. This is a three way battle going on here, all of which is probably forced out because of Storm Surge now. I guarantee so, you there's Robab did a good job here. He's going to get shot in the back. He's the most hurt. He's actually going to shockwave through trying to find himself a better position here Dr. Lupo and he, he does he, he breaks away he's got a little bit of time to himself now good call there to try and rotate away they are a little split at this point Falcon he's gonna have to rotate back Ginger 7 Josh and Tom Wamo all stacked up next to each other right there in front of the garage of that building I wonder if the campfire is gonna be a clue for them if they do spot it and realize they might be low HP might be the time to push, they have a way to pressure. Five shock waves in the inventory of Robabs means rotation here in a minute is not going to be a problem. The team shock wave could have come in clutch, might be time for it. You see him line it up. He, in fact, he might even be marking it just to say, hey, let's get ready to go. Indeed, that's what he was doing. There we go. Rotation all the way south. Look at that solid push ahead of the team that did apply pressure moments ago. They have the circle advantage now, and now they are sitting at the forefront, able to storm hold. And what a, big a move reckless there. push. They had the zone right here. They, they go outside the storm, uh, like, the safety zone, just to try and force that fight and then failed. You got to think the storm, the potential chance of taking damage from the storm, might, the storm surge might have been the reason for the push. Not 100% sure. We didn't have the number up on the screen at that moment. But you have to think, throwing away a positional advantage the last second there, especially because you know the storm timer, the circle timer is on your screen. So they know that at some point, if if they're gonna push, they need to make it quick or they just need to wait. They chose to, to move out there and now they're on the outside. Meanwhile, you know, three HP. The other two from the trio, and so he amplifies still up. This is this is the the, uh, the winners from game one, by the way. Oh, they are. They 25 are the points, a big lead. Going into game two. This is what we like to call shambles loot right here, man. <laughs> Mira with no heals, three HP in a dream. Amplify also equally hurt. They do have a couple of eliminations to their name here, but it's looking pretty dicey. Look on your mini map. They have to rotate past so many teams and they're sharing loot right now just to try and give everybody a chance. I almost would say maybe Miro drop everything that he's got just in case, you know, any any chance to boost up the other two is at this point. 3 HP is not the best situation to be in. Here we go. That's how he pushing forward. The other two not yet on his tail. You see, you can watch in the minimap just a second there. You actually right have behind. to, you have to appreciate that. So he kind of lead in the charge here. He's the only one with shield on his team. So he says, you know what? I'm going to go out first. I'll do the building. I'll do the leading here, taking the pack to the next zone. And I mean, they gets them a little bit closer to the safety spot. I think the play here is either catch a pick, get this siphon or, or buy time, right? Hopefully yeah. a, a yep. launch pad comes down. You guys get a little, get a little share time on it and they can, they can get that way to the zone. That audio cue, you hear the shockwave. That actually is a very good signal for them being low HP. They don't want to make a move before Ooh, somebody Hunter. else. And Hunter gets almost beamed into the ground, but now they know that they're basically free to rotate the player, the team that was Huge potentially going to be a problem. Big hit there, gets the elimination of Hunter. Very valuable. Amplify does, in fact, go down. You see in the top left, Raxo takes him down from D-Mind. 23 trails remaining, 61 players total. The threshold on the middle right, they're 343 damage above. But Miro still sitting on only 3 HP. The mini's going to be a big pick up there. Now 53 hey, total. At least he gets him a little more health here, right? Puts him in the game, keeps him in the running just for a little longer. Now he has the option to pick up this this blue pump, and he actually is going to opt into keeping the gold tack. That's actually a pleasant surprise there. Wouldn't have thought that, you know, the pros would take the slower pullout time from the gold tack over the blue pump. You get a, a 200 damage hit with the blue pump. 
can mean the difference between making it into the circle and getting stopped by somebody. Maybe you get surprised inside your own box, somebody takes your wall. Situational awareness is big for the blue pump to be extremely effective and your accuracy has to be on, but man, when the thing hits, it really hits. You really gotta appreciate this push right here because they're still fighting for this game right here. There's a minigun over to the left. That hit right there is gonna hurt a lot though because again, the heels are so sketch here. I think they have one more mini oh, left to their name. Yeah, actually perfect huge. time to come with the explodes right there. He's trying to break through the build. Someone's going to catch a sneak shot from behind, though. That back right corner, Miro down to 49 on the ground. That's Zoe probably going to have to leave him out to dry there. Another team making moves on the side. The safe zone, the next safe zone, the bottom middle of your screen, or bottom middle of the current safe zone. You see in the bottom right there, the mini map. Five damage below the threshold, Skype. Solo right now looking for a tag and he does actually find it and an elimination is a big point right there. 20 trios remaining to get close to placement points before too long. Just looking at the feed, I saw Mitro still in the running here somewhere in the game. So that trio, top five trio still in the running here. I think our number one team might have been completely wiped during that push right there, so they're out. They cannot accumulate any more points, but they did pick up a lot of eliminations, so you best believe they're still in the top 10 as far as we know right now. But it's so early. It's still so early. There's a lot of opportunity here. We still have a number of games left. Camo, Harmy, and Pepper at the top of this, looks like four or six block tower. Stinger to apply pressure. While the minigun is going, love the EU tactics. You don't see too much minigun other regions right now. This Tamawamo Tama. does go down. Imagine that many rounds from a trio all shooting at your single bill and you're by yourself. It, it, basically GG at that point. And this team here is also just heavy on the Elims right now. An effective seven plus for the squad right here. And they have the prime position to catch the picks of anyone rotating from the backside. This is actually perfect too, right? The heavy congestion is below them. They don't have anyone up here in this layer with them. The closest person is this trio right here to their to their left. And it looks like it's time to get that focus fire on. Yep, here comes the minigun. The mark for attacking right there. Stink to apply and make a move. You use those HP tags to pop up the five to see where your opponents are rotating. Now they're they're in literally the very bottom of the same builds. You have a ton of people stacked up next to each other at this point now. But Camo, Pepper, and Harmy look like they still have the ultimate high ground, the best spot on the map right now. That being said, they're on the far west of the current safe zone and they need to rotate southeast. Hopefully somebody's got a launch pad or shockwaves in the inventory to make this rotation. Otherwise, they're gonna have to build across and tarp over everyone else underneath them. You do still see Benji, Fishy, Mongrel, and Mitro right there on your screen. They are still in this one. Looking down from almost the same angle. Here we go, rotation with the launch pad. Well above the damage threshold for Storm Surge. Excellent spot and 12 rockets in the RPG. They're gonna build on pre-built structure over there. Let somebody else put up, might even be their own builds. And this is exactly what you want to study big. from this star trio right here. Zone six, they there go for the high ground. So they're he actually going to take the high ground. He's going to catch two on the knock right there, which means that team is really hurting now. That's going to be Voren who gets taken out there. Voren was also in the top five, if I'm not mistaken. So that's a power takedown right here. It's going to allow this trio to just get one step closer, kind of breaking away. Get, it's you know, come to fruition before the day's up. Mitro staying a little bit towards the back. Keep throwing down those RPGs at players that are rotating or the builds to see if we can get dropped. Some people, Mitro pick it up. There's those two elims in the feed. So he did secure both of them. That puts the entire trio at six total right now. 17 points. Is, and we're looking at placement now. Top 15 trios remaining. Only 29 players, though, as the elimination feed is starting to light up across the board. These are the zones that really cut the player count down as people are moving, especially when you have one of, if not the best trio on ultimate high ground with an RPG. Are you kidding me? But they are remember, in the best spot. Remember, it still it still hurts to hold high ground from zone six so early. They're going to be forced to jump down soon if they can't, you know, kind of map conserve properly. They're getting broken down consistently now by the shockwaves. These are one of the cons that happen when you take that high ground because you don't get the, the pleasures of looting the players you drop, right? It's just like that. Those All that loot's gone. They exactly. actually can't use it. And every time you hear a shockwave, you'll see these players snap and look up in the air to see if they can try and find who's on the fly. In case you have free shots as that elimination is secured. Mitro picking up a, a knock on Falconly in the feed. 
Another one for the trio, seven remaining. I've got to say, if it, this is not a win for this team, I don't know what is. They're it's it's going to be a close one. Mongo actually did not have any more uh, AR left in his gun. There's no more RPG left here. It's a straight up shotgun battle. This is a crucial Elam. That's going to get them some of the resources that they need to hold this high ground here. And it looks like it's cutting back across. So lucky for them, they're going to be able to kind of re reuse some of their resource here. We have a couple players left in the game here. Red Rush in the low ground. Shaka and Cal as well. And here's Micho just raining fire. That tax sub SMG is so good for shredding through builds right here. And honestly, it can pierce through the turbos like right there. These are the shots. Good pressure right here from Mitro, putting it, putting down the fire, putting all the ammunition to use here. We're almost in the final zone now. This is it. Storm zone nine. The close in will happen. Looks like Benji Fishy's gonna go for that high ground. You saw him esc uh, elevate himself right there. So he's gonna get out of way, uh, the harm's way of the shockwave. And Mitra's gonna stay down here and just get down and dirty with the TAC SMG right now, Lupo. You have to remember at the last set of placements here, the points really kick up as you go from fifth to fourth and third to second, and then the victory royale. So every time you see a player go down, like right there, the four trios remaining get even more points. As soon as one more trio goes down, we'll get it first and second, and that's it. And we're down to the very last second here, the spray from above. This honestly, as soon as we got to top 40, this was Mongrel, Mitro, Benji, Fishy, all the way to the end. No surprise here. And a monstrous 12 Elim game right there. And you saw even in the final moments, they did try to drop a couple of medium bullets there. But with that, we're going to send it over to the studio with Zeke and Sundown. What do you have for us, guys? Oh man, MMB starting off the day strong. We are one step closer to Shio eating an entire jar of mayonnaise. It's escalated because he said cup, but we really didn't define cup. Some people was like, is this standard measuring cup? And someone was like, honestly, it should be a World Cup. I was actually just back in the kitchen looking to see if we could find any mail. I'm gonna have to make a run tomorrow because after that last game, it was just incredible. So that is two matches down in the heat. Let's take a look first at the standings in see where we're at after the first two games because hmm that's weird Who, who's that up top is this that might as well just be shio eat mayonnaise i mean I, I think so the reads. one thing and we saw they had a number of elims they were in actually fourth place after the first match but then the 12 elim plus the victory were out zeke talking about it every single one of those being a point and then the victory out being 15 as well pushing them up to 38 they're already seven points clear of Falcony, Robabs, and the Vic, who've been playing very well. 19 Elims there is pushing them five points clear of Amplify, Miro, and Matzo, who had an incredible first game. I mean, it's been an, oh. I just want to throw out a quick little apology. Based on score, I had assumed that because Matzo, Miro, and Amplify had first place, that they had the Victor Royale. They, in fact, did not. So my apologies. All we were given was placement on the, on the screen. That's my bad. Back to you. <laughs> we got to keep him honest, and uh, we love him very much for it. Uh, but don't forget, the top eight are moving on from this heat. So right now, you must be this tall to ride. So if we're looking at just top eight, the points, 18, that's just like a victory out is worth 15 points in and of itself. So even if you get that victory out with three eliminations, you can now look to strike up in the top eight. So, and we're only in second game. We're about to head into game number three. What does this spell for like all of these other teams? Yeah, you just have to stay consistent. You have to not fear. If you have a couple of bad games, that's okay. If you're able to get in, get situated, get a couple of eliminations, get some placement points in there. As you can see right now, to be on the first page, it's 11 points up there. But one thing I do want to take a look at here is some of the gameplay that came out from Mongrel, Mitro, and Benji. They were able to play so well, and Lupo even hinted at it, saying, at around like top 40 or so, you could kind of smell that they were going to have that victory out. It had the sense of, hey, they were going to get high ground. They had everything they needed. It's like, oh, this looks like it's going to be a win from them. Let's hop on in and see how they're able to execute and get this done. And one thing you'll note is when they are on high ground, they're so incredibly disciplined with their angles. They're constantly looking around, adjusting, putting rockets towards their opponents, and then keeping control, working with each other to make sure that they're finding the right targets. I mean, Mongrel's aim on people who are in the air, honestly, you'd think he's using a controller the way these players just get beamed as they come through, but no, it is just his amazing bro. 
just as Mitra would say, that's crazy. They are running it through 38 points up top. And again, always on the high ground. And for me, that's what's so impressive. In a meta where there's so many RPGs, so many shockwaves, the way they're able to not only get initial control, but then run the rest of the lobby without having to drop down and putting themselves in bad situations. They were never threatened. Count the number of times in this clip that bullets or anything are being shot back towards them. Everyone else is so focused on just trying to rotate and avoid damage from above that these guys don't have to do really anything in terms of defensive play and they can just focus on going forward and it seemed like it was just going to be a win and honestly i want to roll this all the way back to shall we just be talking about the retail drop spot and how your early game sets you up for an advantage they have so many tools at their disposal from ammunition to rockets to excess shields to having enough mats because they had rotations early on to hold the high ground it just makes it so easy and so clean and I promise if you are a trio or you're just interested in competitive Fortnite and getting better go and load up these guys server replays watch them play check them out on their socials you might want to actually mute their streams every now and then because they can get a little loud on the comms ballas does a great job breaking that one down and let's actually take a look at page two of the standings because as we talked about in the heat formats the top eight are going to advance but just so you can get a hint five elims right now is getting you up into that second page there is 32 teams in each one of the heats you need to be in the top 25 percent in order to advance in europe every single one of these guys is impressive but they're all capable of stringing together a couple of good runs you have six games a third of them are down you're now into kind of like the meat of it in the next two games you don't want to fall out early so expect to see some intense battles early on and maybe a little bit more passive play kind of in the mid game because people don't want to get dropped out you don't want it to be a third game and then fall out and realize oh we're that much more off the pace now we really need to be pressing forward i think you'll start seeing aggression in games five and six but three and four they're gonna be playing a little bit more like me hanging out just being like oh there's people over there no i'm good so not like me, who does not even get to play. Got it. Uh, yeah, we'll have to see how things go because, again, like like Sun I'm saying, you have to be top eight if you want to move on to grand finals. So for a lot of these teams, I think I think we're going to see that, though. Maybe even some teams that are even on, say, page three, they want to try and make top eight. So they might just say, look, we're going to contest MMB at retail. Let's just go for it. We have six games. Let's try once. If it doesn't work out, we'll change up the plan. But... I mean, that's, I know that's, that's tough, a tall man. order. I'm I don't, aware. I don't, like, I, I wouldn't say like so. Retail loot is strong, but there's a reason why you see the most dominant teams kind of staking their ground mm. in retail because it's like come and challenge us if you want. Because if anything, that benefits us more. We're confident that we can take those early game fights with you. Like, if you want to split and try and do the blacktop houses, like that's fine. But these guys will end up running at you. They will take the challenge because for them, like they see 50 pots, they see points on the leaderboard, they <laughs> see ways me. to climb this way up. No, it's serious. That's how. MMB, that's how Volk's in them, that's what they look at retail as. If you want to come there that confident, and the mental game is so important, particularly in a heat structure like this, where if you're right. in the first two games, if you are hanging around off this page, if you're not in direct contention, you might think, man, I'm struggling right now. Like, we really need to get into it, but in reality, you're able to string together one or two strong games, or even a victory royale right now would put you through. Right? Yeah. And any of these guys are capable of able of winning one of these games. So I think they can do it, but it's all about keeping a strong mental game as you're going through. It's tough, man. I mean, as much as I want to see Shai eat a jar of mayonnaise, it would be kind of cool to have a new trio come up and, you know, dethrone MMB. I am about that, but uh, it's just going to be a lot about mental game. You know, like you're saying, if, if you start to just lose your confidence even just a little bit, that's going to affect your potential placement in top eight. We'll have to see though. I'm getting a little, I'm getting a little too excited, Fortnite fam. I want to see more of this. Um, but yeah, look, I think we're getting ready. Battle bus, the players are boarding. will be there in just a moment. I think we have a package here in just a moment. Um, but what do you think, man? So do you think, like, I don't, where is Aqua? Did we see him? Is he on page they're one? Not, they're not in the seat. They're not in the oh, seat. Oh, okay. I'm it's sorry. It's different heats. It's okay. Different heat. This there is, is heat one. So which brings again, me to my just next to point. remind people, is it a little a little too excited here? There are four heats no, coming through in Europe. Eight teams <laughs> will be advancing and going on. And the way you're able to kind of score and work your way up is through eliminations and placing higher up. Though in Europe particularly they have the highest amount of participation so all of these players have been they are at the very tippy top right this is the top 001 percent 
Right. These are the best of the best and the people who are very able to like compete against these guys. So like they're able to elevate their game on a particular day. However, as we're sitting here and able to like have our own predictions, there's a reason we all think Mitro Mongo and Benji have done it. There are repeated trios who have shown they're consistently stronger and that much better than the rest. It's not like we're basing this off of like who our favorite players are, right? right. It's going and looking at it and breaking it down. But for now, we're going to throw to a 10 minute break while we sort some stuff out on our end. We'll go talk to the bus driver, try and get that going. You guys take your bio breaks, whatever you need. We'll be right back. Hello family of Fortnite, Ball TW here and throughout the Fortnite Champion Series, we're going to be trying to get more acquainted with the world of competitive Fortnite. Today, we're going to be discussing the three different stages of a competitive Fortnite game. The early game, the mid game, and the late game. And what different players have as their goals during these stages in order to achieve the ultimate goal, the victory royale. Let's start with the early game. Also called the looting phase, this is where all players are attempting to secure their chosen landing spot and maximize their loot potential. In competitive Fortnite, every game matters. So players try to strike a balance between high loot opportunity and safety so as to not waste a game by being eliminated early. Do you drop at a high loot POI like Retail Row or Paradise Palms? or land at a safer POI on the edge of the map, where less players drop because of less loot. Regardless, the goal is common. Whether you take a passive approach by looting safely on the side of the map, or an aggressive and risky approach by letting others loot for you and finding early eliminations. Now that we know what the early game is, what should we be looking out for during this stage? First things first, being contested. The first realization players make when landing is whether you're being contested or not to prepare for the upcoming possible fight. Trios want to try to force your opponent into the more disadvantageous position cut off from loot potential. Either they have to make a desperation push or they're stuck with less loot where you can easily clean up. That's just the beginning, as even though it starts off high intensity with all the different POIs being contested, it quickly slows down as the rotations begin towards first zone. Looting doesn't end here, and most competitive players will have a loot path which optimizes their possibility for finding the crucial mobility and weapon upgrades. Thanks to the new battle map feature in the replay mode, we can study these loot paths and rotations quite easily these days. So go check that out in any replay from the Fortnite Champion Series by going into the Compete tab and finding your favorite player. It will vary from game to game, but generally, we move into the mid game around the middle to end of second zone. The mid game is the calm before the storm, before the storm circle gets too small where it forces the engagements. Most players' goals are positional, but in some cases, depending on how the early game went, you again have to strike a balance, this time between looting and farming or going for the best position. Looting could include playing extremely aggressive to earn yourself other players' loot. In trios, it's much harder to play that aggressive playstyle, since fights take longer and cost more. You want to be efficient with any rotations or fights you have to take. You don't want to spend your precious mobility, valuable resources, or health. This is why you'll see a lot of the top players look directly for center zone in the mid game. When you're in the center zone, you end up giving yourself the most chance of being in the next storm circle when it gets revealed. You'll then have to go less distance and thus spend less materials. Finally, the end game, the most exciting, hectic, thrilling, and difficult part of competitive Fortnite. Experiencing an end game can be confusing and hard to process, but it will also be one of the most rewarding and fun times to play and watch. This is when you take all the advantages you built in the early game and the mid game and use them to push yourself to a victory royale and also find as many eliminations as possible. In the current Fortnite Champion Series format, every elimination matters, just like it did in the World Cup. From six zone onwards, where the calm from the mid game explodes into a cacophony of tunneling, mobility usage, and shots being fired, you'll see teams go for the ever so advantageous high ground, where they can tunnel very cheaply and have the most opportunity on the rest of the server for elimination, as they have the top down view. You'll also see teams call out the need to find a good layer, which is away from other players, both above, below, and horizontally from you. You'll see teams desperate for the extra materials to last them through to the full zone closure, going for impact eliminations where they can top off on resources and power weaponry of their fallen opponents. So, whether you're watching or you're joining us on the field, take stock in the stage of the game, the early game, when you're trying to get the best possible loot while it's still available, the mid game, where you're balancing positioning while maintaining what you built during the early game, and finally, the end game, you spend all the advantages you set yourself up with to earn the victory royale. Use this to form your game plan in order to earn as many series points weekend after weekend. And maybe next time, we'll be watching and highlighting your top plays. This was Bala TW, and I'll see you in game.
guys, Shadow Wager here, bringing you a breakdown on one of the most dynamic, flexible, and clutch items every trio is utilizing in the Fortnite Champion series, the Shockwave Grenade. We're going to be taking a look at some of the basics on how it's used and misused at crucial moments in the game, and how to adapt and play against them towards the end game. To get started, let's get a refresher on what Shockwaves are and some of the basics of using them. Shockwave Grenades are a utility item that drop in stacks of 2, with a maximum stack size of 6. When thrown, the Shockwave launches anyone within its tile and a half radius far distances, destroying builds in the process, with the added protection from fall damage for the players who use them. The most effective way to gain maximum distance is to time your jump well with a Shockwave right below you, angling yourself above it for higher vertical movement, or towards the side of it in midair for horizontal coverage. If you do use a Shockwave to rotate through builds late game, you will only be able to go through about 5 layers of wood, brick, or metal before you come to a stop. When going for height, if you don't get stopped by any opposing player's builds at all, you can reach upwards of 7.5 tiles in height, giving anyone above you a surprise and changing both yours and your enemy's game plan in a split second. Although really easy to understand and use individually, once entering the atmosphere of trios and teamwork, the use of shockwaves enters a whole new dimension. There are deciding factors and win conditions if used properly, allowing for easy positioning and rotations. Using them and sticking together after the landing is efficient and gets your whole trio online ready to fire at a faster rate compared to the rest of the competition. Saving these grenades for later use brings an element of surprise as well and a level of shock to the whole server. Looking at 8th and 9th zones with densely packed endgames, vertical shockwaves make high ground and mid ground layers crumble and give patient trios and surviving solos a way to counter long tarps and bases towering above them. Facing off against 3 players usually proves fatal though, as you are vulnerable throughout your whole flight and easily targeted by the trio you're trying to attack. Trouble building walls on the way up from your shockwave Panicking with shockwaves in your own box and misusing them is always an irreversible mistake during the game, giving you poor positioning split away from your trio, costing you building resources, or ultimately you and your teammates their entire health and shield pool if used at the absolute incorrect moment. To counteract the chaos from shockwaves, new and clean strategies are put in place to negate the negative and potential mishaps in certain situations. When going for height, separately boxing up before using the shockwaves and going for height then allows you to have power in numbers as three players get a vertical rotation together, overwhelming the competition. Discovering new positioning and shockwave throwing angles and targets within your box might keep your trio and teammates closer together when using one shockwave to rotate saving crucial mats and attracting less attention during your mid-game rotations. You also save your total shockwave count by doing this, allowing for more opportunities to challenge high ground, grief low ground in the end game, or rotate in mid-game. Countermeasures can be taken too, such as keeping a teammate higher than normal multiple layers above you, as in the event of a vertical shockwave, you still have someone up high who can rain down and support your trio on a retake. Keeping your own shockwaves handy is a way to counter anyone taking height off of you as well. But if both trios play mind games and the circle gets smaller, smaller, and smaller, the more likely a chance there is for a messy, repeat shockwave circus happening all at the same time. Player after player gets sent flying in the sky, with teammates all getting sent around in and out of the storm, off their tarp layers, and splits costing your trio more mats and resources than normal. Identifying these mistakes, staying in your lane, and watching teams move is a good way to anticipate and prevent disaster from striking before it happens. Although an item overlooked as simple mobility at first, the potential and efficiency of using shockwave grenades as a trio separates the good players from the great, and practicing, reviewing, and watching how plays are set up before they happen is a good way to keep in the loop, improve on mistakes, and get better retakes on height when using one of the most versatile items in the game. Keep your team's position in mind while breaking, jumping, and blasting into the air until you get it just right, and who knows, maybe you can have that top play or amazing clutch that saves your team while competing in the FNCS.
What's up, Fortnite fam? So first of all, sorry about that. We had a little bit of issues on our side with the European matches flushing, but there's been a ton of Fortnite action going on this morning anyway, with Middle East wrapping up their first and second heat. So we have the final results, and we're going to hop into some of the action. And also, I just want to say, my predictions for Middle East are looking pretty good. I know Z kind of hinted at it, but you can check out on the FN Competitive Twitter and also on the YouTube some of our prediction and our preview piece we were able to go through and we talked about what some of our predictions particularly in the Middle East and European region are so make sure you get up to date on that get what our thoughts and opinions are but we're going to be hopping into heat to match one of the Middle East region in just a second here. And honestly, I'm excited. It's going to be the first time seeing Middle East in outside of the open tournament format and seeing the top teams really go at it. And honestly, looking at the heats afterward, there are a lot of big changes now up on the board here. You can see there were some differences in the predictions. One, I will say, I was the one who predicted Flame Prime and Hunter up there. So swap Zeke and I's names, but otherwise, them in the Middle East Grand Final tomorrow. However, Flame Prime and Hunter were also able to have a positive day in their heat and advance through. So predictions so far are holding steady and it's going to be exciting once we get in. There is a different style of play, different types of gameplay from all over the region, but enough from me. I've talked enough. Let's throw it on over to Lupo and Monster as they take you into Middle East Heat 2 Match 1. Sundown, thank you very much. Just a quick note to those at home. Occasionally run, we run into issues uh, on the cast. Do your best to, to not get too worked up about it. You know, there's a lot of, there's a, a lot of things at play here. So you have to imagine a 10 minute break is, is an insanely short amount of time to, uh, to recover and get back into the games. As you can see here on your screen, Heat 2 game one of the Middle East region just starting off. Tilted town, a number of Teams dropping down the bottom. Down here, pressure in the bottom and the pump shotgun. An early blue pump shotgun in Tilted Down. As you can see, is honestly one of the most powerful weapons you can get. It just hits so hard for it. it, it and so many shot. up close fights, too. Such a clean shot. And that's one of the perks of landing in Tilted Town. You know you're going to get a blue. You know you're, you're leaving a blue pump. You're leaving with shockwaves. You're guaranteed heals. Like, guaranteed exactly. minimal. Exactly. Uh, not only that, you're probably going to get yourself some launch pads as well. So this is the place to be, especially if you want to guarantee your loadout. And <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, it, you, know, that's you stick around just to that's get back tough. to the lobby. Not much you can do there. You catch one pick, maybe you get a point for, uh, for your leaderboard, basically. But... It Even then, you have, to, to lose. you have to hope it's like a solo. Otherwise, you know they're just going to get picked back up almost immediately. It's a tough spot to be in. Uh, but yeah, it, you're saying early game in Tilted has such a refined loot pool. The trade off of not, not being able to build, or in some people's mindsets, not having to build, because you know that you can just focus on gun skill and accuracy, is such a big factor in building up an early loot. Like, it, just the early loot game is so it's It's huge here. It's like actually said, crazy feels too. like crazy. Yeah. Everybody's going to come out stacked with a, a good set of materials, in fact, just because you can you can pick up all that stuff out of the chest and off of every elimination if you do get challenged here. It, it's, it's arguably one of the better spots to drop right now. Yeah, I was just going to say, imagine a game where one of these guys bring that double barrel out of Tilted Town because there are some rules in play where the double barrel shotgun only spawns in Tilted, but you can you can even take the weapons out of the place as well. And Third time's a charm. There we go. Finally I was going to say, top. he's having a little bit of a struggle there trying to get up and over. He's got to track down that space bar. It runs away sometimes. Almost yeah. to play on a controller, I guess. My apologies. Controller gang, love you. Control. If anything, Controller Gang has the, the best movement we've seen so far. Those guys can go 360 on the Clearly, you don't watch my stream, Monster. That. I appreciate it, though. Yeah. <laughs> but all right. Now we're looking at Happy Hamlet here. A little bit of a standoff. Moon, Minzu, and Kinji here have that high ground. There's three teams here. The prediction from four of the five of us, one of the players, uh, Klops, Going down on the feet up top there, you hate to see that. And if, if, if I had to guess, I actually did a ME, a Middle Eastern VOD review. They land towards Junk Junction, so they must have had some kind of problems over at Haunted Hills, but we'll, we'll talk about that in just a bit here as Kenji uses a valuable shockwave to try and take the high ground here, and he is going to get chipped just a little bit. And such a nice pinch going on right here. And this is one of our newer competitive regions, so, you know, a little bit of catch-up, right, to 
to, to catch up to the rest of the competitive scene per se. But I now they even, have. I wouldn't even say that honestly, because some of these players are so good, Monster. I mean, uh, we've we've even watched each other grow yep. very quickly playing the game just from watching these competitive experiences. You have opportunities like this. Look at that. The Kiji immediately flicks up, gets the knockout info, is trying to shockwave from uh, you know, over the top. But you have to understand these these players in the Middle East region have been asking for their own region for quite a long time. So you know they've been watching the competitive experience between all these other regions. That, that kind of learning Ooh. has to have happened big time. That was a filthy little ramp edit right there to catch Good AZ shots. to M. And yeah, that's what I wanted to touch on is that they were held back for so long because of the ping differences, right? Yep. But now having their own region, a lot of it has, you know, a lot of these players have found a little bit of remedy in, in that factor as well. So good for them. We see new faces come up and, and have their moment. Pretty much catch a little, little highlight here today. Can you pick it up the revive right there on Minzu? Knock for the middle of that fight. A valiant trade, though. Honestly, if you if your team only suffers a single knockdown, you pick up those three eliminations, I'd say that's 100% worth it. Those bubble shields and rotation out. Team moving up on top of the hill. And not so lucky was, landing. He was actually hit with a little headshot right there, ripped apart all of his shield. Now forced only down to bandages, and this is a battle that they have to take on their heels here. And I like what they're doing. They're backing up as a squad, trying to use this time to also gather some mats in the process. This team is not letting up. You have the NL squad right here, Nella, Easy, and Saya Zine right here, or Saya's Ren, excuse me. And they're coming in with a the push. They're still fully shielded up for the most part. Now we got the ultimate high ground right now. Gonna have to fight out one player all the way at the top. Shots coming from the third party right there. Looks like a teammate trying to knock down that build as they're pushing up. Side, ultimate high ground looking down from above. A little explode from underneath. Gonna have to build against that. Waiting for the peak shot. Look at the timing on that. Very last second before getting to the pyramid. Gets a ton of big shots. Looking for the last one. There it is. Finds the knock on Izzy. They have the advantage at this point. Picks up that elimination up to 125 total HP. Nella gets knocked. Wild Gamer picking up that elimination. And an RPG in there is going to be huge. Tack shotgun shots back to back. Finds the third one. And that is a solid three eliminations for Psy. Wild Gamer making it up for the loss of silence down there in the bottom left corner. Fighting on the heels right there, and they turn that battle around. Very well done. Not Sai, I've actually had the pleasure with, I'm pretty sure, talking uh, as I've, you know, browsed around the Middle Eastern region. So good to see him pulling up and performing here as they now are pretty much clear. And they have the zone. They're in the clear. They have the zone. They can get this revive off. So Silence is going to be able to come back in the game as he gets hit up on the reboot van. A huge value. That being said, the inventory of Sai has... Two green tactical shotguns in there, some bandages, an AR, and that TAC SMG. Lucky landing, looking like it is calm at this point. A lot of builds, but no competition left down here as these, this trio is going to be able to pick back up, potentially fi finish looting up down here, farm any materials they can get out of it. They're in the safe zone. Circle still has 38 seconds before it closes, so they're not feeling too much pressure in any way right now. We'll have to see where the next circle goes. This is a good opportunity for them to build up a, a good buffer materials, healing, any, uh, any uh, leftover loot that might be down here and make their way out of the next safe zone without much issue. Meanwhile, Super, Sammy, and Dream pushing from outside of the storm. Yep. The far east drop here in the desert. Such a weird place to play as, as well. The moisty palms where you, you can't just crouch freely. You have to be very cautious. A lot of the competitive players opting to unbind the, the crouch yeah. just in case. You know, you don't want to make any mistakes there. And honestly, if you do that, you're, you're kind of in the advantage, right? You, you, uh, you set yourself up for, uh, for success so you don't make any mistakes in PvP. I know, I know myself, I tend to crouch in fights all the time. You don't really realize it till it happens, but. It is a, it's a tough break when it does happen, I'll say. <laughs> Looks like a, an attempted shockwave to avoid a fight there, but Super does get the pick there. A knockdown is rotating into the storm. Trying However, to get to safe. That's gonna be a nice little knock there. He's gonna replenish his health up. There is a player Ooh, outside of the storm waves. line. It's gonna be his teammate, Will, who's waiting nearby. And you can see over at the other kind of crater there to the left where you can farm up all the stone that's a probably quarry. where the rest of that guy's duo is most likely trio, i should say here but someone does see Look, the yeah, see the rotation it. they're pushing on in we have a trio coming in i say now's the time you have people just coming in from the storm you think you're in the better position pushing is basically a no-brainer you see here i have to fight to stay in 
He heard the shots outside the storm wave. He figured he might as well push out. These guys are going to come out with a little bit of health tick. Anything to have that advantage there. Drop him back. All right, Sammy Will and Super here says, you know what? This is not the battle we want to take. The third party. Oh, it actually isn't a third party. They're just pressuring with splodes here. So they're, they want to back up. They want to reset a little bit here. I don't blame him. You, you basically started that fight not as a full trio. Sammy was still outside in the storm, and so rotating back away and saying, nah, this is not the fight to take. We're not exactly in the best spot. Plus, if you think about it, they did force that team, the team that applied pressure from, from inside the safe zone, to burn through some traps. There were some zap traps in the wall, so you've gotten rid of those, cleared those out of the inventory, which is great for late, later in the game. Ultimately, kind of a win-win. Set of eliminations here. This is a nice little look right here. You can see those teams that are on the west and north side of the map forced to fight their way down now. Quite a rotation here as the zone seems to be pushing all the way south. So the later you move, the more congested this rotation will be, the harder it will be for you later in the games. You really want to get down there early, especially when a zone favors one side pretty heavily. You see competitive players try to rotate nice and early. I'm looking for Nazir to hit a snipe shot here. He keeps pulling that heavy sniper out and taking a look. Hasn't gone for it yet. I would say positional-wise, uh, position not the best call. You draw a lot of attention to yourself as you are further outside towards the edge of what is currently safe. So you, you, people are probably going to look back and try and storm hold you. But could you imagine Nazir hitting just a crazy snipe right there on the rotation in? They suddenly have advantage of trio versus only two left up. They could push through, pick up three elims, all the materials, and make their way in the safe zone. And this, this is actually very interesting right here. FHD actually opened this battle up with a heavy snipe. They catch the knock, but they don't even collapse to uh, to kind of seal the deal. They say, you know what? Instead, we're going to focus more on the zone here. They're going to get ahead. So they use that little bit of distraction, downtime, and chaos to get ahead of the zone here. It's probably still going to convert uh, if they can get to the zone first and then turn the battle back around. Depends on how fast the storm is moving on this edge. They are closer to the short side, so it's moving slower. But yeah, you have a chance maybe for a pickup there, but I think, like you're saying, in that moment they say, yeah, we got the knock, we could push for it, but placement at this point, probably more important. You're still, you're looking at 26 trios remaining. You don't get the placement points until top 15, and even then, it's only three. So right now, pushing into the storm, getting to safe, very, very important. You wanna try and make it to that top 15 as early as possible. You know, get to a safe spot so you can sit and wait. And you saw a little bit of a storm surge warning there as we're approaching zone three. You have to be cautious when there's over 70 players to the zone three ratio. Storm surge will start to tick. So there's only one trio probably affected right now. This trio here is completely safe, 105 damage above. But anything can happen. They can get pushed by the wrong ones. The other team can jump into a fight. So at this point, only one player needs to go down too, and we might actually find it. There it is. What a snipe! FHD looking back to the. East over there, a quick little flick, a 157 body shot. They're going to try and apply pressure. The teammate up top trying to secure, maybe get a, a chance for revive stinks. They actually used a lot of resource just to try and keep that player safe right there. He chucked back the zap trap and the stinks. So using all, if not most, of their throwables right there just to hold the power squad down here in the factory area. And this is the second time now they've caught a knock and they haven't quite, you know, sieged the moment. Very patient. Will uh, it bite them in the butt later on, though? Honestly, I think that's the smartest play because you see right now all three of those players up on the hill are stacked up next to each other. And they may have seen, because you had people that were rotating in, I believe that's mm. southeast of the, the little factory area they're in right now. So they get the knock, yeah, but you, you're down below. Your only option basically is to try and take shots on the structure and get that the knockdown player exposed and immediately eliminate. If you don't get that, that player's crawling back and using the line of sight on the hill. Plus you have other people that they're gonna see that and a chance for third party. I would rather see the, these players do exactly what they're doing right now and sit inside the build, do all the wall replaces and wait just a minute because what might happen, and you see on your minimap that almost is, is the call there, that trio, the one that they got the knock on, there's a team further outside. They're gonna get pressure from the back. They have a chance to sandwich. That might be eliminations that they can pick up later rather than applying pressure and maybe getting third party themselves. I almost also want to say though, that's the same team as them got sniped twice by yep. FHD. So he's a magnet for the heavy sniper. Gotta be careful, buddy. Little, little rivalry. Tuck, tuck up the there. head down. You gotta duck. Careful on the peaks here, but NM7. 
Teams are collapsing everywhere. Minute left. Oh, and he catches another gosh. one right in the tail. Aziz TV is going to go down, and this time they are not safe. He says it's time to battle. They want to push this through with less than a minute on the rotation here. In comes the Stinkers. The heavy snipe cracks open the wall, and there is a team nearby. They can hear the shots. They're looking over yeah. if you look at your map, but they're going for safety instead. It's yeah, a long rotation. Around. You see that those two trios in the south southeast side, they're rotating around trying to get in the safe zone. Meanwhile, these two, these two teams that have literally fought each other time and time again now are finally applying pressure. NM7 with a buildup, trying to get the high ground. Not gonna be able to do it just yet. Gonna wait just a moment. Doesn't want to get pushed too far in on that trio without his teammates at his back. One elimination currently, but if the pressure is good and gets a better position, might might be able to convert that into another three. We'll see here in a second. Shots from inside the safe zone, they're gonna have to, they're just at the edge. And there are so many teams so close together. One, two, three, four, I believe five trios within probably 50 meters of each other right there. And, and Aziz and his trio is actually really lucky. Aziz was traded out, but that, that duo, what was left of the trio, managed to squeak away here. Heavy Snipe returns. He hits are another one. FHD is on fire right me? now with the shot. So you can see here, this team is scary with a double Heavy Sniper. They're loaded up right now. Here comes the focus fire. A trio Ooh. focus fire is big, but FHD pays the price. Another team up behind. This is what I was saying. Five trios in one, like basically one 50 meter circle is so tough because as soon as you start spraying on one, everyone's going to look at you and say, you're exposed right now and you're not looking at me. It might be the time to take a shot. Imagine if the, instead of AR spray, that was a heavy snipe. That could have been an immediate knock and then suddenly the tables are turned on this team for power. That's right, but it's okay. Power has plenty of heals to spare here. You saw he did manage to pop two big pots right there, so the squad kind of hooking him up. They still have six chug splashes. They have, you know, slurps for the road. They're very, very set up right now. With how close together they are to other teams, I'm surprised they're not using, they have 11 chug splashes. Use even just one of those just to top off one player and get your last one to only five HP missing because if you're in a bad spot and you start getting beamed, you're gonna want every single HP that you can get. All oh, the double snipe, double, double heavy, snipe, here double we go. Snipe. Looking for it, finds the first one, beams and not side goes down, straight into the launch pad to rotate into the circle. This trio's playing very, very well. Not Sai should have known better than to sit still in a one by one. That is one of the risks you take, especially in trios. There's way too many eyes focused on the field here. There's no way you can sit still in a box. That's the price you pay right there. FHD, Yance, and NM7 doing a fantastic job right now holding the, uh, the server down. Really, they're, they're dictating the pace right here with all pressure, all fire coming in. This is the most active trio we've seen so far in the server. The east side of the map basically belongs to them thus far. There is that team. You saw him look up above on top of the hill looking down. You got to be very careful on the angles. Would not be surprised if there's a chance that shots come down from the top. NM7 getting shot. Team from NES over there. In back, one tap just past them. You look very top middle of your screen. That's the team I was talking about. They're all the way up top. They have a zip. They have height advantage. The little window peak on the, the, the brick wall that's edited right there just out of, out of screen now. You also down in Happy Hamlet have Minzu, Moon, and Kinji. The ultimate high ground down here. Number of teams underneath. This is actually a fantastic loadout as well. Six shock waves, two shield bubbles. They're set up so pretty up here. Nice little headshot right there from Kinji. He's gonna put some hurting on that team right there. They do have a heavy snipe to crack open the build as well. Stink, someone tries to take that high ground. He's gonna eat a couple of bullets for the sandwich right there. Assaulting goes down by Kinji. Nice reaction speed right there. That shockwave play was not the one to do. A valiant effort, but did land right in the middle of a trio, all kid of the teeth. Kinji has that shield bubble out. Looking to potentially make a rotation soon. We'll have to see here. I almost want to see one of these players toss it straight up, knock it down under their own head, and make oh, a move with it this, at the same this. time. So he puts the bubble down so Good that call. their pad doesn't get taken out. So he says he's going he's gonna to set that up for the safety measure right there. And just like that, they are able to skate away and get to the next safe zone here. Nice long rotation, perfect launch pad. Not a single one of their teammate was affected or shot on that rotation right there. So that was a very clean pad away. Power still solid right there. Toggle, Eska, 
Another player from one tap's gonna get taken out right there. Toggle's chucking in all of the grenades right here. Flexi goes down. Kiki or Iki gets taken out right there. And he catches another knock. That's a triple knock with the grenades right here. I don't He's know just letting them go. But grenades are pretty good. Especially when you have so many players stacked together. You have your teammates spray down the walls where you're tossing those things. And just look at the map. They're all in the same spot. So naturally, you're going to hit someone. We're about to get into placement points here just before we cut. We have 16. There you go. 16 trios remaining. As soon as we get to top 15, everybody picks up a set of points, 34 players total, which means a lot of these trios are no longer trios. You have quite a few single or duo players left at this point as the feed's still lighting up. Players are now forced to the northwest side. Oh, I see. It looks like Ten they're setting up a shockwave, right? Are they trying to set up the perfect shockwave? Kind of play here, angling the structures. You Craftsmanship see, is key. Just yeah, as a yeah, reminder, no, it, it's important to, to set it up properly so that everyone can can get on out. But it looks like there's no yeah, time there's left. No time. They're just gonna have to go up. ahead and throw it down. It's gonna be a very scuffed shockwave here. But Honestly, single that's not bad. Off. Yeah. Single, the big move there, landed literally in a set of builds already, and there's edits set up. He now has a bubble shield to protect. He can look back and try and help his teammates if he needs to, or make a move here. He's gonna try and build up to his duo. Eska does get taken out there, so Toggle is yeah, going to get in a little bit of a 1v1 right here. Someone of a box battle is trying to look for that re He's replace wall. You have to wait there for it. it. Nice shot. Noor is going to eat the big pump to the face right there. He's going to put him right down. There was nothing he can do. He kind of asked for it. Literally just point. waiting. Just waiting for the edit. You know it's going to happen. Just wait for the edit. It's boxed in. Going to have to try and get ahead of this storm. It's down struggling. to 13 HP. Traps down. He does have the splashes, but it is not enough. That trio goes down, looks like in 13th place. 12 trios remaining as the rest of the field shockwaves, tarps, and launch pads towards the next safe zone. And now we're looking at the end game, zone seven here. You have your teams already situated up in the high ground. Shockwaves are already flying all around you here. Power, NM7, we're jumping back in. We saw land some ridiculous snipes earlier today. He does it. still have that heavy sniper. Someone is going to sneak up behind him, but they have a nice little pinch right there. Great white shot right there. Doc Luke, but he catches anatomy with a quick cleanup and quick reaction speed right there. It's actually two that fall down to them. And they're still a full trio. Big hit. Quick little splash. Uh, put another 20 across the board. All three teammates sharing that heal. Great Excellent job. call. These Great rotations job. in. Trying to get these quick edits and try and tarp while your teammates are still with you. He's out of mats. And healing. That's big. Yeah, no mats left. And M7 is empty now. They're going to have to trade off who's doing what on the team. Still making moves, though. Bubble shield there. Plus, the zone is right at their back. Player dropping in. Same floor behind. Rotating out in the storm. Trying to stay safe, but can't quite find it. Back into the safe zone here. And M7's looking back. This is a great opportunity. If he had held that for maybe two or three more seconds, he might have had another shot on the player that did get the knockdown underneath. I think movement into the safe zone is key here. But he's only sitting on three builds. He's got three metal builds remaining. Nine points, and there's six. Six trios left to trap behind, just in case somebody tries to drop down in, but does get broken. Player underneath. It is basically chaos at this point. And then Sayer is the absolute slayer so far. Oh, oh but he is going to get chipped down right there as Minzu takes him out. We've been following Minzu Yonks and FHD for this, this, all these players for so long now. This is looking like the toe-to-toe -to -toe right here. Minzu on YouTube. Box Fighter, Moon, and Kinji all have the high ground right here. They have stinkers. They have splodes. They're set up for success right now. Here comes a quick edit. Minzu's trying to get this peak right here. Is he even going to be able to connect? No, the shockwave pushes him out. In comes the firing. He doesn't have time to push it all the way through. It's going down. Somehow, they close out by staying alive just long enough. The shots, the trades, FHD and Yonks were holding it down, actually trading the shots. The shockwave was perfect. Minzu's trio went from the only full team left to both players knocked and Minzu in the storm because of a single shockwave so fast. I think nobody on that team saw that coming. Absolutely ridiculous. Last couple seconds there. Now, uh, just to t take a look back and really give us some details. We got Shy Wager out in the studio. What do you got, Shy?
Heck yeah, these guys had the power, they brought the force and cleaned out the game even at the worst circumstance possible. Even throughout the game, we saw he double heavy snipes. We saw so many cool utilizing mechanics being used across internationally, which is huge because, you know, Lupo and Monster had a conversation. Are these guys caught up? Do they have enough time? Is everything, you know, in place for this region to be at the top spot next to EU and A, right? We have this breakdown of a little bit of separation in the middle. We have NA West, EU, Brazil, as well as NA East, and they're all in that big top eight region. But we have these top fours, the first time team and ME on the board, these games actually broadcasted as well. We can see people now becoming stars, right? We could have the next insane, calmer, clutch individual mongrel, but you know, international across the seas in a different time zone playing his own type of metagame his own type of strats being dropped down from height going upwards downwards everywhere around the entire server so it's really cool seeing how a new region develops and exactly where they actually place themselves in the timeline of exactly how their skills are how their build fighting metagame is what they try to do on height afterwards a pattern you see we saw in the first eu games where hey if mmb have height everyone below them no shields at all every tag it's a headshot from a scar it's an easy 72 white damage tag that usually gets them that elam at the end middle east same way we're going to break it down in just a second but there's an entire type of shifted metagame where it's kind of those early season three season four tendencies combined with the knowledge you have at the end types of you know season eight season nine end games where you know you're rotating you're tarping you're saving your items at the same time early game you're using them immediately no thought whatsoever you have everything on your board you have your inventory you know exactly what your teammates have the comms are nice Everything's on the plate, ready to go, ready to get feasted on. So Middle East right now for me is just, uh, is, is really nice. We're gonna be going into a clip actually of an early game, I believe, Happy Hamlet game. Uh, we're gonna dive in with Kinzel, I believe. We'll see how he plays out. Actually, no, this is a power clip. At the, there we go, Kinji. Kinji up in Happy Hamlet. It's gonna be really dope to see him actually cut out Forest Team on height. We talk about the metagame, right? When Shockwaves first got introduced, it was a straight pump or combat shot upwards. It took, it took people time to get used to that AR spray. He has it in his inventory already. These guys are caught up, they know. Ramp edits, practicing creative, right? Very ingenuous, um, a lot of ingenuity there, as well as wall replacing for protection. It's not raw gameplay, it's actually curated practice, and they're brand new to the actual international scene, which is amazing. You know, baiting your teammates out for HP, going for finishes, even support players like Moon know exactly what to do. Now, the star trio that won that previous game, Power FHD, knowing how to use and take angles properly. Has traps in front of him, doesn't matter. Knows to stay for those right-hand peaks, knows when to engage, low HP, still does not matter. No pressure taken because these guys have practiced. This is not their first rundown, but is it is their first showdown of exactly what they can do, right? No match here has the elims low health still knows exactly when to look up what to loot when to use your utility and when to support your teammate and still have a presence in the game which is once again something players learned a lot later so these guys are caught up with the meta game they do know how to finish off they know their exact win conditions as well and when to drop them through amazing gameplay we're gonna now tune in and see what else they can do on the middle east i'm gonna be picking it up with my man zeke coming in we're both gonna hit that cast we're gonna see exactly how these guys go down we'll relive that breakdown actually together live Zeke what did you think about their presence compared to the rest of the international regions man I think we still have quite a bit more to see from this region I think you did an amazing breakdown there uh, I think the ceiling for me, me me is still very high we haven't quite seen what they're fully capable of but I think over the weekend we'll definitely see it I'm also excited that we get to finally hang out shy shy wager and Zeke Chic. We have come together. That was great. Actually, that is a true thing of, of the game. But anyway, the games are ready. Let's hop right in, Fortnite fam. We are jumping out the battle bus. We're going to begin this game. I can't wait to see what happens here in this game. Because remember, these happened over this morning. Earlier on, while everyone wants to sleep, including myself, I slept like a baby. It's kind of. That's not entirely true. But anyway, we're getting into it. We can see now where people are trying to land early. So, I mean, you know, you've got the pleasant there. You've got a team of junk. Uh, the old villain factory, you've got some at Snobby, some flying even over Greasy. There's still quite a, a bit of teams, though, still that are airborne. Yeah, see, one thing you mentioned earlier, Zeke, was the whole idea of these games happen this morning, right? For me, chewing gum, you leave it on the table untouched, still good to eat later in the day. Mm -hmm. There's so much flavor in these <laughs> games we have yet to see. No, seriously, man. Like, once again, I we're tuning with Power 8. Look at this pattern, right? 
I, I kind of, you know, went to the uh, FHD slash Mongol comparison. Mm. These guys are in retail. Mongols in retail. You know, we, we had uh, Monster, Lupo, saying these guys have been waiting for a long time, right? There's so many VODs they've been watching. They, they have the knowledge, man. They have the power. Yeah, and now look, they land over here on the, uh, what do we like to call this? The top side is black tops. So residential. This is residential. Yeah, there yeah. we go. I, I literally came up with it as you were saying. <laughs> What's wrong with me today? <laughs> uh, but they are on the residential side, which is good. I, I personally, I, and this just might be like my thinking, but I feel like the loot's a little better on residential side than black tops. Would you agree? Or do you think uh, it's the other way around? I think that there's more, there, there's sparser loot on the blacktop side. We're looking at Tilted right now, but I'm gonna keep talking about what we saw in retail. There is sparser loot on the blacktop side, but like residential um, does have, I think, more drop spots on the floor loot. Mm. But you know, we got those bendings on blacktops and you have more of a uh, horizontal advantage on everyone you see. Yeah. So it's a lot easier to kind of, you know, pick a game plan on blacktops. With residential, you kind of have to all in all the time. Yeah. Because if you do get engaged on, like once again, you're, you're all in, right? We see it in OCE, X2 Twins, they always end up having a fight, some type of highlight. It's really cool. Right now, though, you know, Lupo and Monster went over Tilted Town, the advantages, disadvantages of building and not building. What are your, th how, how do you think player opinion has been of Tilted Town from the, from the beginning to the end of how people treat the drop? I think originally people were maybe a little uh, taken off guard by the fact that you could not build in Tilted Town. It was like, wait, but the whole thing is that you have to build and whatnot. And it's like, well, yeah, that's still a very big aspect of the game. But now there is a POI dedicated to you testing your shooting skills, right? How good are your angles and your peaks? How good are your rifling skills or even your close quarter combat skills? And that's what Tilted offers uh, in its current state. But we're back on board with the power trio, the trio of power. They have themselves a brute. They're looking to take it to this other brute across the way shy. Now what's crazy here is remember, they have these laser designators. So they've are the other brutes fully aware. They're like, hey, there's another one. They're moving toward us. We need to try and take this down. But power's on 18 effective HP. And it's just not enough. They are so, it's so easy to be focused down in the Brute right now. So unfortunately, power, uh, FHE is going to go down. And I don't think there's anything else his, his duo, his the other duo can do about this, right? They just kind of have to let him go down and regroup and assess the situation. NM7 does have the Sniper. So if he can get a cheeky shot off, he can down someone immediately. But like, look, the other Brute spawned like, no, 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 friend. We're going to hunt you down. Don't worry. Don't get too far. No, absolutely. Like Brute combat is one thing that also has its own metagame, and like these guys know too, right? Focus the driver 100%. Usually the people you put into the Brute early game are those who don't have the same amount of loot. We're looking at a pump, tack SMG, gold sniper on NM7. But FHD, all you have were zapper traps, a bunch of gray items, very easily focusable. And right now, it, you know, their enemy team is big and hard focused. I'm pretty sure it's the ASMR guys, Spy and Wagner. These guys are just coming in with a big Brute of their own, forcing through straight up the game all the loot as well. One big thing about having a brute in retail, it's like butter on toast. Perfect combination, even jam on toast. Anything but mayo. Uh, it's, <laughs> it, it's you, you get these loot spawners so much faster with the stomp mechanic as well as the rockets. Granted that they were nerfed at one point, you still have so much damage to instantly just get these launches over and over again. The biggest downside to retail being you spend so much time in there, right? Mm -hmm. You negate that, you have the perfect setup. Enti entirely in the whole game. Yeah, and then you can kind of take that brute into later game and use that to kind of uh, mess with other trios out there. I like this too, the, the ASMR trio. ASMR, they're quiet. <laughs> they are in the brute right now. They are destroying the spawner. Shy, what is the loot pool looking like if you sat there and retail and destroyed all the loot spawners? <laughs> I personally think that um, a lot of launch pads a lot of campfires and a lot of uh, ARs everywhere for you, including pumps. I like, I like that very much. But now we are across the way because look at this, Minzu and Kinji. Uh, this trio, we saw an absurd amount of snipes last game. Now, many of them they couldn't follow up on just based on their where they were. But look at this, he drops down and he gets counter drop. That is a zapper. He's got to be careful. It's okay. All right, I thought. <laughs> I thought that wasn't Moon. I saw a second <laughs> shot from the right, and I was like, if that is this enemy trio, like, Minzu's gonna be eliminated. There's nothing they can do, but it's okay. Moon was there, he had the assist, and look at the loadout. It's just shining, a ray of colors. Yeah, uh, happy Hamlet. I broke it down in one of the job shot breakdowns. Vendings galore, so many chests, right? You eliminate as much of the loot pool as possible to what you need mm. to keep looting over and over again. You know, loot drops, chest spawns, 
every vending that's available to you as well. You get to pick and choose what you want. You yep. use it in the fight as well really fast if there's just one other team contesting you. Um, looks like these guys are the kings of happy all the way in the Middle East, which is, which is huge. We have now um, two big things as well that a lot of people don't realize in the game is when you have kings of a drop spot clash against each other, you don't really see where people come from, right, in the end game when they're on height. Yep. But now that we know that we have the ASMR boys having all of retail, we have this rainbow loadout on every single person from Happy. We can now see the storyline build up all the way to the end game of these two star trios at the moment in this game. Yeah, I mean, these guys are looking very, very good. But look who else is here. We've got two trios just in front. There is one player from a trio left in Old Yonder. And there's a trio making their way up over a hill by that long ravine there. Okay, so it's Sazerin there, who's by himself. I'm not sure what he's still doing there. It looks like he might just be crouched, just potentially trying to loot there. You got Simar, JD, and Cake, Pat, Cake Park, Dash, Cake Pack, <laughs> Dash. I like that. I like that. I do enjoy some cake as well. Uh, but now they just get to kind of walk into Old Yonder. I mean, there's obviously going to be no loot. They could farm up for materials if they wanted. All right, I take that back. There was one piece of loot, which was just the ammo box. My apologies. Didn't see it. But now they're they're right here on the edge of Storm, right? Yeah. Uh, the new safe zone. So they're probably pr probably feeling pretty comfortable because they do even have a shockwave, which look like they have a shockwave apiece. And they even have a jump pad, uh, the launch pad, to get them to safety. So it's all going their way here in the early game. Yeah, but there's an absolute skirmish all the way in the snow side. We've kind of seen things develop, I guess, even in Middle East as well. A lot of the people like to land split. They like to be mm -hmm. up in the air. So to set a stage for you, Zeke, it's always just, you know, a bunch of people playing desperate with a bunch of trios that have already finished their fights. So you can imagine, you know, how scared people are split off. You can see exactly how they rotate in. And you do see a little bit more survivability coming out of snow side towards the bones over here, towards the big monster skull. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, there is, you know, those mid-game fights that do break down at times right now we don't see any um we can drop into just seeing the options that toggle has now to move towards i guess it's the desert biome towards the bottom yeah i mean there's still so many players left 75 and 26 of 31 trios left don't forget we want to hit top 12 before we start seeing any placement points at all and we're right now in storm circle 2 so there's still so many players that are that have to be eliminated before this end game right i i mean i don't imagine we'll see like Storm Circle 750 people left, but I wouldn't be surprised if we did see that. There's still so much that can happen in this game. Uh, I'm curious to see what's happening back at retail. You know, we, we saw that trio, the ASMR trio. They're pretty looted, and I'd assume with that brood, like, they probably cleared retail, like, super, super fast. I want to know where they went from there. Because right now, even, like, uh, Seagull, Toggle, and Eska, they have no eliminations. Their loadouts, it's not shambles, mm -hmm. but it's, like, borderline shambles, I would say. It's 100% shambles if it's a big zone, but you, you touched on it a little bit, right? Eliminations. When do you actually really want them? What is your win condition? So what would you say if you had shield bubbles and shockwaves, the different options people have towards the middle or end game that they can use to actually, you know, come through for elims or play for placement? Mm, that's a good question. That's tough. I think it depends on because, like, everyone knows what heat they're in, so you know who, if you're paying attention and you're doing your homework like you should be, you know the other people in your heat, you know potentially where they're going to look to land. So, like, if I'm this trio, I'm not going anywhere near retail, mm -hmm. right? Because we already know ASMR trio is there, and we even saw uh, the power trio as well. Uh, so, I mean, right now they're near Salty, which it doesn't look like looking at the minimap, no one's there. Everyone's already rotated out. Now, look, they're just on the outside making their way in. So we're back on power, and it looks like it's just Yonks by himself. This is a brutal spot to be in. He t probably definitely does not have their cards. They're not getting rebooted. There's no way. So right now, Yonks just has to do anything he can. I mean, I'd imagine he's probably wanting to play it slow, right? He's like, look, if I can even just play for placement and get us those points, I, I, if, if he can find an awesome pick, great. But that's just like backseat. Right now, it's survival mode. You have the worst sound anyone could have heard um, for, from him on the server for his situation is that shield break sound. The, the, mm -hmm. whole, the whole you know desynchronization of the shield. So right now, he's worried. He knows trios around him know that he's worried. His entire plan at the moment is to use, you see, half his loadout's already gone, right? Mm -hmm. he had, we, we talked about when to use your loadout, when is your win condition, do you want elims? You said it, Zeke. It's full survivability at the moment, and Yonks has to go to the Bronx and even further 
now to even <laughs> win the game, right? Like zero elims, the easiest thing to do, right? Getting three points for eliminations is three separate fights. A lot of mats used there, right? A lot of gun skill required, um, a lot of brains required in the fight against three other people. But if you separate it into entities on the map, right? You only have a maximum of 31 trios on the map, 31, 33. So uh, in this game specifically, I think it's where 26 out of 31. We're kind of far from placement, but separating it into just looking at singular entities moving around the map and playing placement that way, right? Mm. Using your mats against one entity rather than three separate ones in a fight. You can then kind of, you know, segment out your loot, your minis, your mobility, and actually get further and get three points without getting insane frags in an actual fight. Yeah, that's very interesting. I hadn't considered that. Mm -hmm. That's pretty dope, but I mean, I mean it's tough, right? Like, I, I, I want to be hopeful for Youngs in this game. And what's different is, like, during qualifiers, you know, you had kind of 10 games and you had three-hour window. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you were in this situation, you could say, look, I'm just going to run into a team and hope for the best. And even if I was eliminated, it's fine. We're just going to hop back into another game. But these are heats, right? So, like, right now, everything is on the shoulder of Youngs, yep. right? Because all we're going a game, a full game at a time. So, Youngs just can't say, all right, I'll let's just let this game be our wash like no he actually has to sit here and try and i mean if i'm fhd if i'm nm7 i'm sitting there like looking out for him like right you've got a team here you've got a team there like just try and keep yourself positive because like for me personally if i was in this situation i <laughs> it would be so stressful <laughs> yeah but these are the very best of the best they're here for a reason as i say that caster curse in full effect <laughs> i <laughs> finished my sentence and yogs gets picked up it's okay all they have to do is go back in, let that game wash over, and prepare themselves for this next game. Uh, well, for them, this, these games already wrapped up overnight, so for, hopefully for the next game, he, he, he steeled himself, you know, at least hopefully. Yeah, you touched on it a little bit. This is really, it's, it's going to be a weird analogy, so I segue, but bear with me here, right? You I'm said listening. the game was on Yonks' shoulders, right? Mm -hmm. In cartoons, you usually have like an angel or a devil on your shoulders, right? Okay. To break it down for people trying to clutch up in that situation, replace the angel and devil with your win conditions, right? Am I looking for free Elims rotating? Am I looking to play safe? And every time you see one of your shoulders kind of ding, that's what you have to play for. You have mm -hmm. to suppress all the other easy stuff you see. Maybe there's a free heavy snipe you can take, right? At the same time, that exposes you, right? Your right. whole full shoulder is not lit up there. You got to play at the side of the angel. So if you're trying to learn how to get in the clutch situations, trying to learn exactly how to rotate in the game, what is right, what is wrong, segment it out, wait for the proper shoulder to light up, and that's an easy way, right? Right there, Yonks, the mistake he made, he kind of chose the devil shoulder he saw free tags for rotation he knows he needs elims because he has zero but in doing that he brought the full force of an entire trio out right yep. he talked about entities he turned a full one entity he could just block with mats to three people to face three separate ar shots he got erased from the server man that's so dope yeah see shy wager dropping these <laughs> knowledge bombs and making my inner child who loves looney tunes just so happy right now uh, i appreciate that shy that was very nice it's very well explained Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're looking at an entire different scenario. Um, M. Sadig, I've actually seen this guy have some amazing highlights in game and actually clutch it out in the Middle East server, sometimes topping the charts of our top plays of the week. Currently, he's going to be leading an actual trio. We're actually on Rampage's perspective right now. But these guys are absolutely raw when it comes to just taking those free aim duels, just engaging on fights and following up with stuff. Right now, I've never seen more stink tags from one stink on an entire trio. S goes down we saw Eska last game as well as well as rotating mm -hmm. earlier now they're very set on loot but once again they know that win condition right yep. even if you're not solo as a trio what shoulder is dinging I got a knock okay stink follows up right that's how you you have that whole momentum process you have it planned out you just got to look for the right pings to follow through and if they had some kind of mobility I would imagine they probably would have gone in and cleaned up this trio right because they got so many tags like you're saying once that scene came out it was giving two damage numbers and they were taking pretty much the entirety of that cloud you know they're on low HP so at least one of those guys is dropped really really low unless they have something and they're burning resources like a like splashes a slurp even a med kit or bandages like you know they're burning through materials to try and get there. I'm glad that they were able to say, look, we probably don't, we, we're not gonna follow up. We don't have, we could either tarp all the way over there and we burn a bunch of materials. They hear us coming and they're ready to react 
where you just say like, you know what, we got them to use their stuff. See now We're you're on good. that you're on that shoulder wavelength now. You know I got exactly it. What's right. I got it. Yeah. See, there, there you go. go. So now you can point that out every time you see it. That is literally the explanation of what wind conditions are and how to follow up things in the inventory, right? A lot of people used to hate stinks. They realize that you know people randomly stink me all the time. That's kind of when they first came out, right? People mm -hmm. didn't actually know how to follow up with them. But now we still have four stinks in Rampage's box. He's ran through how many trios beside them, right? He's not throwing them for no really dilly reason whatsoever, right? right. He's using them in response with explosives and it's in response with a the knock. They're complementary items that aren't as griefy anymore, but actually strategically used to, you know, shake up an entire trio and not just have them box up the entire time when someone else actually has an advantage to push on them with. Man, that's pretty dope. That's pretty mm -hmm. dope. Plus, I mean, you probably, if you are this trio, you probably want to save as many stinks for Lakeham as possible, right? Because once the storm does start to shrink super, super, cold, like, small, those stinks become more and more valuable because then you're just, like, blanketing an entire tarp, and you're saying, as long as you guys are trying to get to safety, you're going to be taking five ticks, so you guys can hold that L. But, but at the same time, like, their loot isn't great, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's... Probably mid-game centric, which is fine, but now we're starting to move into that late game, so they want to try and find another trio to get their loot and kind of propel them forward, because, like, you've got the green pump, sure. You've got the long range in the air, sure. Four splashes, awesome, but, like, those aren't power weapons. Those aren't a heavy side that you can just punch a hole in anyone's one by one. That isn't nades or splodes uh, that you could potentially use to get pick up these eliminations. And look, the power duo right now by themselves, they're just chilling and they have got the attention of uh, Siddiq, Siddiq and Rampage. Yep, not to be confused with the other power trio that we saw go down. There are multiple players mm -hmm. from many different organizations that are playing across actual all the regions and in the same region as well. Yep. These guys are still alive. Looks like they have one person. They might have a full trio actually. Yep, looks like 90 is there with them as well. You actually touched on a very cool aspect I want to um, touch on as well. You talked about loadouts and endgame and the map, right? I'm really glad you brought that up because Ooh. because the later the game goes, the less space there is on the map, the more your loadout actually pumps out and matters, right? Mm -hmm. A green pump and blue pump difference is a, like, huge in mid-game fights. But when that circle is small and you're riding Storm, that's where even just having a gray AR for a follow-up matters. There's not that much separation between, you know, just you want to have a spray weapon. So right. you got an amazing breakdown, you know, kind of these win conditions get so much more diverse throughout the game as they keep going and the zone gets smaller. So that was a, that was a really cool breakdown. Hey, I like that a lot. Thanks, yeah, yeah. man. I appreciate Let's you. Go. Man, this is the first time we're hanging out and we get to freaking take our breaks <laughs> together. I love it. Yeah, it's nice. Here we go. The alter, different alter ego, Namfu, Mev, and Ego here, Dennis. Uh, so not the alter ego trio we're used to seeing. More of their comrades. And they are, they're on five eliminations, you know? They're about, they're in top 20 right now, which is huge. If they play for another eight trios, they're gonna get themselves placement points. Now their loadout's looking real good. They just picked up a minigun, which is huge. They have three stinks. An RPG, a blue pump splashes as well. They've got materials almost 150, almost fully capped out. These guys are looking real good. So now this is gonna go back to your, your shoulder dinks, right? What are you looking to play for and right now? As the storm comes in, you're looking to get these tags, right? Anyone's like, oh, the storm is literally on my back. Time to start moving. The, the, those are those people that these guys are looking to pick up if possible. They're also on the low ground tarp, which is going to kind of shape kind of how they're going to be forced to engage people coming up here shortly. Yeah, these guys are 100% playing the horizontal game. As you said, low ground tarp means you cannot go lower at all. Means right. that you are fighting for your lair 24-7. The reason people love having mid ground yeah. so Don't much do this. <laughs> is because they can actually move, as you can see, up, down, left, and right. They have an entire new axis they can operate on. But low ground does have its perks, as you saw. Ultimately, no matter what, you end up on the dirt when you're moving around the map, right? If you're not on your builds. So plays like that where you force people down with the trap, they can't move anywhere past you. So they right. have to interact with you. So owning this lair, although it is the hardest, it, you know, ultimate low and ultimate height uh, most of the time, it does have some of the most rewarding things because A, you never need to place floors when you're ultimate low, right? Same you, materials that way. Exactly, you know exactly where your elims are coming from because they're all usually above you or behind you in storm. You're never gonna be challenged from the bottom or diagonally from the bottom at all. You basically have very good camera control around your entire horizontal axis as well as just looking up slightly to just see what's happening on your floor and if any RPGs are coming down straight up above you. So it's actually not bad to control ultimate low. The only issue being that is everyone's desperation play to go to randomly <laughs> when they are at the end of the game, right? It's like, hey, I'm in trouble, got to drop low. So there's so much 
to take account of on that horizontal plane, it gets hard. Now we're looking at a six zone rotation. This is where the action and the meat of the game comes in. The first placement point getting dropped top 12 now, 34 people alive, Zeke, the heels are still there. So is an RPG. What does that mean for their end game? I mean, right now they want to try and challenge for high ground and get the, the, the highest tarp possible and then start raining those RPGs down. And look at this, 700 rounds in that minigun. Dennis wants to try and apply pressure to everyone. It doesn't matter where they are. He wants to use that minigun and try and put them off edge because now, look, he's going for height, which is smart, and they actually got it. This is going to be great for them. They can rain down those shots, and everyone that's on those lower ground tarps, though they had the advantage of being lower, now they have to worry about this constant minigun pressure from above on, on, count of, on top of people on your, your tarp, people below you, people also using other types of explodes. Are there stinks in play? There's so many more things that they don't have to worry about being on that high ground tarp. And now they're just saying, yep, everyone down below, just keep worrying. No, 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 it's fine. This minigun, there you go, spammy. Oops, sorry, spammy. You just got picked up on the crossfire, right? Like, he spammy still got spammed. He got spammed. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. But I mean, right now, if you're everyone down below, I mean, first of all, let's talk about their HP. Super non-existent. Feasel's there. The other alter ego, is he gonna go down? I'm not sure there was one of the ASMR trios. Top nine, uh, top eight, we get another round of placement points. There you go. And now this is just gonna be on the alt, this alter ego duo and Dennis to try and close out the game. No one's even contesting it, by the way. This is the first RPG we've seen go out. So now they're saying, great, everyone else is down below is fought. They're all super low. Let's start using our resources, start trying to burn people down. Yeah, because you guys have that default split broken down as well. Dennis on top while Meb and Namfu are at the bottom, making sure that even if there are shockwaves, right, people have learned, they've played around them. Right now, minigun sprays coming down. People have saved their hard match for this end game, but in doing so, they might have taken tags through their wood moving around in the mid game. Those tags will prove crucial because every minigun shot is 20 to 25 damage on the person straight through their builds. Right now, it's just an easy beam, an easy spray from high ground. We saw Sadig earlier who was controlled one there of height, ultimately down at the dirt. Klops actually goes down one of the top trios in the region. Hopefully he makes it through the heats. We will see the standings hopefully at some point. Right now though, Dennis, four Elims. Mev, another four. We have a total of 11 Elims on this trio at the moment with more to come. There still are, a, there is a top two spot available for placement. That minigun is not stopping all the time they could use for rotating and making sure their builds are fine. They don't need to because their height, they use it on pressure gets all the way down the Logan City gets that big knot and Kappa no joke this time he gets taken out Dennis the whole trio surviving all the way back to retail where we started what a lore and eventful game seek that was so much fun don't forget though that means that hero Kappa there was um, don't forget he's on Klops and Diesel's team so placing second is 12 points so shout outs to him to making it the last team Good on you. But now we're going to send it back into the studio with Dr. Lupo. What you got for us? Zeke, Shy, thank you very much. It's interesting to see how over time uh, we've seen a lot of other regions build up around you know, different competitive metas. And now that the Middle East finally has their shot, things are, uh, things are a little different than I think we've expected. We've seen from, uh, from other regions in the past. It's excellent to see the competitive nature of these Middle East players. And uh, Sundown, what do you think so far? It's been really good. I mean, honestly, a lot of what we expected, the teams who have been up on that leaderboard consistently pushing into really the top five in the top 10, they've been up there in our predictions. They all advanced through to tomorrow. And we've seen kind of the disciplined gameplay where people are stacking on their teammates, relying on it and playing for the late game, doing everything they can to try and avoid those early and mid game fracas to avoid kind of those big sharks who are running around looking for the elims and get into those late game scenarios. But I know there are a couple of plays you wanted to take a look at specifically here. Very specifically indeed. Now uh, production prepared a little package for us, specifically I believe around Alter Ego MEV. We're gonna take a look at that real quick. Let's jump right into it. This wall, absolutely ridiculous. Now. As you were saying, a lot of the team fire stacking on top of each other and taking shots at players in opportunity positions like this gets a pick, quick pickup on Teddy's, and it doesn't stop there. You have players rotating from the outside of the map, and you'll notice the shots start, MEV takes a couple, and the comms between these players, it immediately becomes a three-player beam position where they're just, they're up above everybody else. The comms will say, hey, guys, right over here, and everybody, just the, the team fire out of nowhere spraying down on the builds as players are trying to make these rotations and the RPG shots uh, uh, in alter ego on alter ego elimination there in your feed you hate to see it but it's it's communication like that that is created especially in trios we see it more 
than in, uh, in duos or solos, and that's why I'm excited maybe one day squads as well. That team fire is so powerful. Even in a, in a position where you're going to get a you know, third party from another team rotating in, we've seen in a couple of games so far in the Middle East uh, today, you have team fire positions, but you know the pinch from either side, but you have all three players taking shots simultaneously on one or two walls. It's so powerful that not even uh, not even all the builds in the world can save you from that. And that's putting these players in, in spots where not not just one, two, three eliminations on you know from one trio to another, but maybe the team behind that's pushing in, it feeds into you know a chain of eliminations that's gonna push some of these teams higher up the board than I think any of us expected them to go. Yeah, and you're seeing that a lot when you have the three players who are stacked on top of each other, and then their comms are there. I mean, we joke about MMB, like, it's really chaotic, but when they all call out, you see, boom, everyone snaps over, and the team fire happens instantly. You're seeing Middle East put off a lot of that right now, but on our end, yes, there are still some issues going on with the matchmaking on Europe side, so we're going to go to a break right now. While we take some on our end, we will have some additional messaging that is coming forward, so don't go anywhere. We're just hanging out. We will have more games going forward. We're going to continue to fill with the Middle East games as we come back, so we're going to dive in a little bit deeper to them, which is something I'm really excited about because a lot of people don't necessarily get the visibility into this region. They don't have the opportunities to really go in and dive into this gameplay and look into what makes Fiesel, Kappa, and Klops so good or what makes that Sam Trio that much better in seeing different styles of gameplay. It's the same reason why I preach during the World Cup. Go take a look at Asia. Go take a look at Oceania. Go take a look at Brazil because you're so used to watching just NA East, Europe, and NA West that when you get these different regions, there are really definitive styles and uh, ways to play the game in different utilization of not only maps and rotations, but items. I mean, you see the bubble bounce came out from different ways. You see the Solari grenades coming out of Europe. People are constantly innovating and finding new ways to play Fortnite. And I mean, that emergent gameplay is what I'm all about. The more regions you add, the more variety, the more skill you're going to see. And, and honestly, the different flavors of gameplay go such a long way. Now, I do want to make a quick note. Uh, if you're out there watching, believe me when I say I, uh, I understand that production delays, you know, it can be frustrating. Uh, and, and without a doubt, the people that are in charge of this are trying to work through them as best they can. I would ask the people that are watching, this is from me, this isn't from Epic, this isn't from anybody like that. I'm sure production right now is going nuts, like what's Lupo doing? Uh, do me a big favor if you're out there watching right now, try as hard as you can to not be uh, frustrated with delays like this. Things happen. It's a very complicated game and there's a lot of systems at play here to get every single thing coordinated simultaneously. Let me tell you, it's it's not easy. There's a lot behind the scenes. So thank you very much for your understanding. And uh, if, you, if there's any frustrations, don't direct them uh, at Epic. Maybe, uh, maybe direct them at your keyboard or something like that. So thank you. <laughs> Definitely protect the keyboard, but I promise you, we are looking into it. We're trying to get it resolved as fast as possible. If you need to yell at anyone, you can yell at me. It's fine. I'm used to it. I said do it right there. Go ahead. You can send it all on my way, but I promise you we'll get it resolved and we'll always have the ability to go through and continue to watch some of these games because, again, it's always great to be able to take a look at the other regions. And, I mean, I'm excited but we're going to be able to see a lot of Brazil today, right? And I want to be True. able to watch that. And that's one region in particular. I don't know if people were going through and looking at how kind of the heats and stuff were set up. Brazil got bumped up. Brazil is on the exact same level as NA West. They have the full four heat structure. And there's been a lot of teams that qualified eight players through each week. And the amount that Fortnite is taking off in Brazil, like definitely want to give a shout out to that scene because both Brazil, Argentina, like all of the South American countries have really stepped up their gameplay, both in terms of involvement and the level of skill and how they're playing in the end games. If you go and check out some of the server replays that are going through there, they're able to put up just ridiculous gameplay and ridiculous numbers and the fun thing is the level of aggression you see that's coming out of them they're looking to take fights in the early in the mid game they know if somebody is like if they don't spot three people on top of each other even if it might be a full trio they're like we can eliminate those two people or we can put some pressure on them to where if it does become a three on three fight we know we'll be able to come out on top. I mean, that's why I like seeing King play that way, seeing Mastir, Dracons, and Blackouts. They're able to put out just such great gameplay. I mean, being able to look into that is fun. But at the same time, like, they don't necessarily have a definitive top team. So one of those guys could get upset if they don't go through. But now we're going to throw it on to a break. So you guys, whatever you need to do, go take a break. We'll be back in a little bit, but we'll also have some games rolling. So you can stick around if you want. We'll be here.